You've heard me say this before, but just let me give you context. We're glad to have you in the house of God. Now, you might be thinking to yourself this morning, now, this doesn't really look like the house of God. This is a, a rented sports arena where they play hockey. But I'm here to tell you that any place the people of God gather to worship the Son of God, it becomes a house for the presence of God, and lives are never the same. It, we believe that the church exists to glorify Jesus and in doing so bring people into an encounter with the presence of God. It, when you are shaped and transformed by his presence, I'm telling you, friend, just about nothing else will satisfy. And uh, we're just here again to pledge our allegiance and our fidelity to the things that only God can do. You know, the Bible records the resurrection of Jesus in each four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It records the story, some with different details, others with a, a broader perspective, and, and others with a more laser-focused perspective. But this morning, we're going to go to the Word of God and look in the book of John and in chapter 20 about what the Apostle John says about the resurrection of Jesus. It, we trust the validity of Scripture because the Bible says that all of these words, they are God-breathed, they are authoritative, they are inspired for the teaching, the development, and the correcting of God's people. Oh, friend, where would we be without the precious words of God himself? It is the exhaustive revelation of who the Father is. From the beginning in the book of Genesis to the end in the book of Revelation, it is God's love letter to his people, and we are not embarrassed to proclaim, even on Easter Sunday, that we are still people who believe believe in the authority and the inspiration of the words of Scripture. I know it's not very popular, and I know we're not supposed to say those things on Easter Sunday. Y'all really believe everything you read? Y'all really believe all them crazy stories in the Bible? Yes, let God be true, and let every man be a liar. I am building my life off of the unshaken, unchanging words of Jesus Christ. The Bible records this story in John 20, starting in verse 11. The Bible says this, now on the first day of the week, now on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, Mary Magdalene, she went to the tomb early. And while it was still dark, she saw that the stone had been taken away. Some translations say, and the stone was rolled away from the tomb. Now, if you're like me, you have probably wondered why we do church on a Sunday morning. And I'm telling you the reason why is because 2,000 years ago, on an early Sunday morning, a woman named Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark, and she saw for herself that the stone was rolled away. See, it was true that Jesus had died, but it was more true that God would give him new life. No, it was true that Jesus had become our sacrifice, but it was more true that God would raise him up. It was true that the enemy would bruise his heel, but it was more true that God would crush his head. And it may be true today that your life feels like a mess, your mind feels overwhelmed, your family is facing a struggle, but I'm here to tell you today that there is something more true than your struggle, more true than your temptation, more true than your past mistake, and that truth is a person whose name is Jesus. You know, before they died, Confucius said, I am not the way. Buddha said, seek the truth. Muhammad said, I don't know the purpose of life, but it was only Jesus who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. It is not a broad road, it is a narrow road. And on that narrow road stands a narrow door, and that narrow door is a person named Jesus. See, there are many who have claimed to be God 
but their graves are still occupied. There are many who have claimed divinity, but their sins have been exposed. There are six thousand world religions but there is only one empty tomb and on Easter we declare there is one God and there is one mediator between God and mankind and that is the man Christ Jesus for in fact every other God is an idol who cannot see and cannot hear, but we serve the one true living God who at his word and at his voice, all of creation stands still. And that Jesus didn't stay in a manger. And that Jesus didn't stay in the grave. And that Jesus isn't staying in heaven forever. For there will come a day at a great shout and at a great trumpet blast that the clouds roll back like a scroll and the one that we crucified we will see descend on a cloud with angel armies and the dead in Christ will rise first and those who are alive will be caught up with him in the air and oh friend this is our blessed hope for he will not leave us as orphans but in fact he will come to us for even like Jesus tells his disciples, oh, I go to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, there are many rooms. No, you can't come there yet. I'm still working on the remodel, but there will come a day where in the same manner he ascended, in like manner he descends. Oh, come on, pastor. This don't sound very politically correct. Oh, I thought all paths lead to God. No, God can use all things to draw you unto himself, but make no mistake, salvation is not found in culture. Salvation is not found in politics. Salvation is not found in wokeness. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved outside the name of Jesus. And I got good news. Our king wasn't voted in, and he's not gonna be voted out. He does not rule by popularity, but instead by sovereignty prerogative no friend this isn't good vibes this isn't new age energy I don't have any magic crystals or feathers for you to rub together this morning in hopes of conjuring up some emotional response I am simply here to proclaim the good news Jesus is alive and that changes everything And as the virgin-born Savior lay dead in a virgin tomb for three days, the disciples who had followed him were thrown into chaos, running from the Romans, hiding in fear, assuming that they would be next. No one dared leave their locked houses and their huddled masses. For everything that they had known to be true had evaporated right in front of them but the Bible says while it was still dark a woman named Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while I was still lost while I was still bound, while I was still addicted, while I was still hurting, that's when I met a man named Jesus who rescued me from the miry clay and the God that we serve still does his best work in the dark. <laughs> oh, see, Mary knew a thing or two about being in darkness. For the Bible says that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. Mary knew a thing or two about being lost. For many historians believe that she was likely a former prostitute. But what Mary Magdalene best represents today is there ain't no one who is too far gone that the grace of God can't reach. And he is still the expert at leaving the 99 to go after the one, freeing you from the grave of life, freeing you from the tomb of your past addiction and your past identity. He doesn't call you by what you've done. He doesn't call you by the last time that you failed. He calls you by your name. And friend, there has never been a God as good as that 
for in fact your darkness is no match for his light. And your sin, it is no match for his grace. And I am thankful today that when darkness surrounded me, it was Jesus who saved me. And if the grave couldn't hold him, then it will not hold us. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And why, in fact, was Jesus raised from the dead? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it was to fulfill the scriptures. Isaiah says in Isaiah 25, it was to provide for salvation. Paul says in Romans 6, it was to guarantee our resurrection. John says in Revelation 21, it was to defeat death once and for all. And I love what the Apostle Paul declares to the early church. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No, today we have no fear when the storms rage. No, we have no fear when we feel like the world is closing in around us. For the Bible says the Lord, he is a strong tower. The righteous run into him and they are saved. David said, there is one thing that I have sought, that which I have desired to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon his beauty, to inquire in his temple that in my time of trouble, he would hide me in his pavilion. Oh God is the safest place that there has ever been. He welcomes you you with grace and mercy. It is still the kind and the goodness of God that leads men under repentance. No, God is not just the angrier version of your absent father. He is a loving God who welcomes you back home. For even when the prodigal was afar off, it was the father who ran to meet him, who gave a hug on his neck, a robe on his shoulders, a ring on his finger, new sandals on his feet. He kills the fatted calf and he says, my son who was dead is alive alive again. And friend, that is the testimony of an overcomer. That is the testimony of one who has been born again and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I wasn't bad in my trespasses. I was dead in my trespasses. I wasn't just a little confused or a little lost. I was on my way to a sinner's hell, but in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus and everything changes. And in verse 11, the Bible says, And Mary, she stood outside by the tomb weeping. But as she wept, she stooped down, and she looked into the tomb. And what did she see? She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. I want you to notice how the scriptures are telling the story in John 20. And Mary, she sees the stone has been rolled away. She assumes grave robbers have stolen his body. And as she weeps, she stoops down to look into the tomb. You gotta hear me today, friend. The devil wants to cause your pain. The world wants you to worship your pain. The culture wants you to build your identity off of your pain. But it is only Jesus that has the power to heal your pain. And your healing begins the day that you make the decision Despite your pain and in the midst of your tears, you stoop down to gaze into that empty tomb. No, Jesus doesn't promise you a problem-free life, but he does promise a purpose-filled life, a hope-filled life, and a peace-filled life. See, many have rejected the claims of Christ because of the problem of pain. How could God be real if there is so much pain in the world around me? And why do bad things happen to good people if God is really in control? 
Friend, do we so easily forget that the worst thing that has ever happened in all of history happened to the most perfect person to ever exist? Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for you and I so that we could become his righteousness. And here's the reality. I still have pain but the tomb, it's still empty. I still have doubts, but the tomb, it's still empty. I still have struggles, but the tomb, it's still empty. And in fact, I'll take an empty tomb over an empty life any day of the week. <laughs> See, in many ways, the empty tomb is a paradigm wrapped within a paradox. It is that which is missing that has caused me to be found. It is that which is empty that has caused me to be filled. And in fact, all over scripture, the words of Jesus seem counterintuitive to the ways of the world. If you wanna be great, you gotta serve. If you wanna be rich, you gotta be poor. If you want to be first, you got to be last, and maybe most importantly, if you seek to save your life, you first must lose your life. For what does it profit a man to gain the entire world and yet lose his own soul? And on Easter, we get to celebrate the resurrection because Jesus was willing to endure the crucifixion. And here's the reality that you might not get told in a lot of places. You can't have new life until you're willing to give up your old one. See, in the West, we want Jesus on our terms, not on his. We want to keep all of our baggage and all of our idols and all of our old ways and then add Jesus as if he were the seasoning salt to an already overflowing plate. It was William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, who once said the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Friend, resurrection life is what Easter is all about. And today you can experience the fullness of what God desires to do both in you and through you if you will simply trust him enough to lay down your old identity and receive your heavenly one. For the Bible says you was bought with a price. No, your life is, is not your own. When you put faith in Christ Jesus, you are transferring the ownership and the title deed of your identity. You're saying, God, not my way, but your way. God, not my kingdom, but your kingdom. God, not my ideas, but your ideas. God, not my worldview, but your worldview. You are exchanging who you used to be for who God has always known you to be. You are saying, I am willing to endure the crucifixion of my old man that God would raise me a new creature creation in Christ Jesus. But see, we like to add Jesus to an already busy philosophical framework. Oh yeah, I'm cool with Jesus. Just like I'm cool with all of the other ways and religions and values and ideas. But unless Jesus is Lord of all, friends, simply he is not Lord at all. We are not going half in on this relationship with Christ. We are not simply dipping our toes in the waters of religion only to live our life in the valley of syncretism. We are saying, God, I have tried every other thing. I've spent a lot of money and wasted a lot of time trying to explore other options to fill the chasm in the human soul. I've pledged my allegiance to a lot of lovers. I've been in a lot of relationships. I've climbed the corporate ladder. I've finally achieved financial freedom. I have gained the world, but there is still pain in my soul. 
It was Pascal, a French mathematician in the 13th century that said humanity spends so much time trying to fill the God-shaped hole in the human heart with things that look like God but don't have his resurrection power. I'm not trying to sign you up for a religion. I'm not trying to persuade you today to make a half-hearted commitment to follow Jesus as a get out of hell free card. I'm saying pick up your cross and with him in front of you and the world behind you boldly declare there is no turning back for I have given everything I have in pursuit of the one who is worthy. No, it ain't a low commitment, it's a high one. It's not a low sell, it's a high sell. I'm not trying to argue you into it because if I can, somebody can argue you out of it. <laughs> I'm trying to lay out the gospel message and in doing so, compel men and women all across this region to put their faith in the reality of a risen Jesus. See, Mary is so upset, she's talking to angels and she don't even realize it. Where have you taken him? Where have you laid him? Just tell me where his body is and I will go and retrieve it. And right in the midst of her traumatic rambling, the angels interrupt Mary with a question that reverberates even unto us today. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? And see, if we was to be honest this morning, isn't this the temptation of the human experience? We seek the living amongst the dead. We look for life in places that can't provide it and then get upset when our expectations are not met. No, those past addictions cannot bring you life. Those past relationships cannot bring you life. Those past mindsets and behaviors and patterns, not only can they not bring you life, but they'll make you more miserable than you were before. See, the graveyard is what God rescued you from. No other world system, religious practice, or cultural philosophy offers you the type of grace and forgiveness that freely flows from the Father above. See, here's the reality. The reason we are drawn to our past life is because even though our past is dysfunctional, it's familiar. And for many of us, the pain of staying the same is not yet greater than the pain of needing to change. But there will come a day where you face a crossroad moment in your life, and I want you to remember these words. Jesus has the power to save. Jesus has the power to heal. Jesus has the power to restore. And no matter how far you've gone or how much time you've lost, if you will trust Jesus, your best days will be ahead of you, not behind you. See, now watch what the Bible says. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was him. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And who are you seeking? Now, now she's supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. See, friend, it's easy to forget that tending to the garden of our life is one of the things that Jesus does best. You know, sometimes he looks like the doctor healing our diseases. Sometimes he looks like the friend comforting us in our time of need. Sometimes he looks like the carpenter helping us rebuild. And other times he looks like the gardener preparing the soil of our heart for what comes next. Now, I would dare to say this morning that just like Mary, many of us have seen Jesus yet haven't been able to recognize Jesus because our eyes are still blurred from the tears of yesterday. And Jesus asked the question, why are you weeping? And who are you seeking? Oh, friends, you got to learn the art of wiping your tears and looking again. 
the emotional trauma of your circumstance works to blind you to God's reality. Now, I know that life might be tough, but could you wipe your eyes and look again. Oh, I've never met a person who has reached the end of their life and regrets that they have followed Jesus, yet I meet a lot of folks who reach the end of their life and regret not following him sooner. And I love this. She sees Jesus standing. See, the last time that she saw Jesus, he was lifeless, laying in a tomb. And this time she sees Jesus, he is alive and standing triumphantly over the grave. Oh, the Bible says that weeping may last for a night, but joy has come on Sunday morning because our God has conquered death, hell, and the grave and now gives resurrection life to all who believe. Oh, where was Jesus in the midst of my abuse? And where was Jesus in the midst of my divorce? And where was Jesus in the midst of my overdose? Friend, I am telling you, he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He has not missed one moment of your life. There have been times where he has showed up as the gardener and you didn't have the faith to see him for how he is, but he was holding you in the midst of it. You should be dead, but you're alive today. You should be lost, but you were found by his grace. You should be in the margins of society out of your mind but Jesus called you by name gave you a new lease on life he gave you a family to be a part of he restored your mental health he healed your body oh where would we be outside the grace of a good God named Jesus oh but pastor where was he when I needed him most he was the gardener overseeing the soil of your heart getting ready to plant seeds of hope and redemption, daring you to believe that what looks like death is not fatal and it is not final because God alone has permission to turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. And here's where everything changes. In the midst of the conversation, Mary not even knowing who this Jesus is. The Bible says in verse 16, Jesus turns to her and he says, Mary. And she turned and she said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And in this moment, the eyes of Mary are opened when Jesus calls her name. Jesus didn't reveal himself to Mary by telling her who he was, but instead by telling her who she was. You are Mary, the one who has been set free. You are Mary, the one who has a bright future. You are Mary, the one who has not been forgotten and won't be denied. And this Jesus still calls us by our name today. He knows your sin, yet calls you by your name. He knows your past, yet calls you by your name. He knows your mistakes, yet calls you by your name. And that's a God who you can trust with every facet of your life and that's the reason the scriptures say today if you would hear his voice do not harden your heart oh come on friend God's specialty is turning funerals into celebrations. He's an expert at turning graves into gardens. There isn't one place that he shows up that isn't fundamentally transformed for the better. See, the enemy has celebrated your defeat a little too early. He thought you was dead. He thought you was gone. 
He thought he could control and manipulate every one of your outcomes. He thought he could get you caught up in the valley of the shadow of death in such a way that you would never leave. But God placed a hope in your heart by which you declared, even when I'm in the valley, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. He is the rod and the staff who comfort me. Even when I'm in front of my enemies, he'll make a table for me. For surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's the greatest turnaround that there has ever been. The enemy is celebrating three days of silence, but what God foretold through the prophets of old would in fact be true on Sunday morning. For our God, if he said it, he will do it, and that's good enough for me. For all of his promises, they are yes and they are amen. For God is not a man that he should lie. And for three days, that nasty little serpent, he thought he celebrated the death of God. Oh, I'll end this little Christian movement now. These disciples, they'll never trust Jesus again. They'll be so scared to death, they'll lock themselves in their bunkers, they'll never come out. Oh, I won! We killed Jesus. And God said, yeah, but this setback, it's a setup for a comeback. Watch what I'm about to do. I know it's been silent, but I'll break the silence with an earthquake that shakes the ground. I'll have angels roll away the stone. I'll frighten some Roman guards until they shake within them. I'll confront some kings and queens and principalities and powers that think that they can somehow stop the movement of God. Just watch what he's about to do next. And some of you, you've been in this three-day waiting period feeling like that diagnosis or that disease or that that declaration about your life will be the controlling identity from this moment forward. But if you could trust God even in the midst of what appears to be his silence, I promise he is working on something exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask or think because our God is able. You know, eight years ago, we planted this church called Pursuit in a barn off of Highway 9 in little old Snohomish. Oh, I never imagined it would turn out like this. Those first few years were tough like you could never imagine. God, did we make a mistake? Did you make a mistake? Are we crazy? Are you crazy? Is anybody even still interested in the Pacific Northwest in regards to the things of God? And God would speak to me in those waiting seasons. God would speak to me in those graveyard experiences. God would speak to me when I felt like the enemy was celebrating our demise. Russell, I got a plan. If you will trust me and lift your eyes up to the hills for where your help comes from, I will vindicate you with an outpouring in this region that will change the spiritual landscape for the next hundred years. Years. We're here today in the stadium. Oh, look what the Lord has done. For eye has not seen and ear has not heard the things that God has reserved for his people in these last days. No, God's reserved something special for your life. No, God's reserved a place of significance for you and your family. You got a seat at the table, it's got your name, and even if you've been in the valley, there is help and there is hope that is on the way. I wanna encourage you today, there is no hole so deep that Christ isn't deeper still. If you feel like you've reached the end of your rope, oh, tie a knot and hang on for our king. He comes at midnight and he does his best work even in the midst of the enemy celebrating a temporary victory. Oh, I'll take the enemy's celebration of a temporary victory every day of the week because I know my God is setting me up for a permanent victory that the enemy cannot steal. I've got a hope that the world can't take because they didn't give it. I got a peace the world can't take because they didn't give it. I've got a faith that the world can't take because they didn't give it. No, we are alive today because of what Jesus did so many years ago. And what God did, he is still doing. And Jesus said to her, 
Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But instead, go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. And so Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. And she said five words that would transform all of Christendom. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The first Easter sermon ever recorded in all of human history. It was five words and it was preached by a former demoniac who got set free by the power of Jesus. And that sermon has become the declaration of the church of the living God. I have seen the Lord. But once you see him, it becomes your responsibility to know him. And I wouldn't want you to leave this room today without a clear opportunity to know this Jesus. See, you can have facts about Jesus. You can hear stories about Jesus. But my question for you today is have you met the man who can forgive your sin, renew your mind, heal your body, and secure your destiny? See, this Jesus, he is worthy of all praise and adoration. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the second Adam who redeems us from the curse. He is the bright and morning star who lights up even our darkest night. He is the promised seed of Abraham who has led captivity captive. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Universal church. We believe in the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And there is still today no other name under heaven by which men must be saved outside the name of the wounded lamb of the universe, Jesus Christ. I would venture to say this morning, you have seen the Lord. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? I just showed up at an Easter event at the arena. I don't even know how I got here. <laughs> but even all of creation testifies to His majesty. When you see the sun setting over the Cascade Mountains, when you see the moon and the stars hung brilliantly in the sky, when you look at the miracles evident even in the natural world around us, oh, I would venture to say, you have seen the Lord. No, this following Jesus stuff, it is not easy. Hear me so clearly today. It'll require the giving of every part of who you are. It'll require that you belong to a local church. It'll require that you are transformed by his sanctifying power. But I dare you today on Easter Sunday to trust God with your future and just watch what he will do on your behalf. Oh, friend, it is true. We have seen the Lord. But now the question for us in closing this morning is what will we do with that which we have seen? There will come a day where every man, woman, boy, and girl stands before a holy God and gives account for their life. For the Bible says that God himself has planted eternity 
in the human heart. For the scriptures declare, choose this day whom you will serve. Either worship the gods or the idols of culture and in doing so have death or worship the God of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and in doing so, have life. This is why we're here today. This is why volunteers and employees have worked day and night for the past number of many months to host this event in the stadium today. It's for this moment here and now that you would find yourself in the valley of decision, compelled in your heart to trust Jesus with what comes next. No, it's not a magic eight ball. I, I can't give you all of the plans and the details of what your life will hold, but I can tell you this. Even though you may not know what your future holds, you can meet the one who holds your future. We have seen the Lord. And now what will we do with that which we have seen? I believe that for many of you, this day could go down in history as the day that you would make the most important decision that you would ever make. Putting your full faith and full trust in the resurrected Savior. That you would never forget what God did in this moment, not only for your life, but through your life. Could I tell you one decision for Jesus doesn't just impact you, it'll impact every generational line that will come from you. The decisions that you make in this moment aren't just about securing your destiny, they're about drawing a line in the sand and committing everything you have, past, present, and future, to the brilliance and beauty of King Jesus. Oh, we've become experts at making a mess out of our own lives, but we're here today to put our trust in the one who can forgive our sins, renew our minds, and save our souls. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. And if you're here this morning and you were to be honest and you were to say, Pastor, I'm not right with God, but I wanna be. Maybe at, at one time I was following Him, but if I were to be honest, I'm far from Him today. Oh friend, could I compel you by the mercy of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Today is your day to come back home. Today is your day to make a break with the old and be birthed into the new. Today is your day to be born again into the family of God, enveloped in His love and transformed by His power. Oh friend, I dare you to trust this Jesus and just watch what He would do with the humble sacrifice of your life. You might be here invited by a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, somebody you like, somebody you don't even like. You might be here because you saw a billboard or an ad on TV or an advertisement on social media. I don't care how you got here, but I do care about what you do in this moment. Today is your opportunity to put fresh faith in the finished work of King Jesus. If you would humor me for just a minute, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you allow me to pray for you this morning? Father, I thank you for my friends all across this room. God, I thank you that none of them are here by accident or incident, but instead with divine purpose for this very moment. God, I pray today that faith would be released in the room for many to believe in the resurrected Savior, King Jesus. God, today we, we admit that what we have tried in our own power has left us worse off than we were before. God, we are tired of running from you. Today, we're making a decision to run to you. 
God, we ask that you would do a work that no man can do. In just a minute, when I count to three, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. And if you're here this morning and you have yet to put faith in King Jesus, today is your opportunity to make a declaration that I promise you won't ever regret as long as you live. But I count to three, I'll begin to pray this prayer, and as I do, would you do me a favor and repeat after me? Here we go one, here we go two, here we go three. Dear Jesus, I come to you today. I come to you today. I recognize that I am a sinner. Recognize that I'm a sinner. And I am in need of a savior. I am in need of a savior. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to forgive my sins. I make you Lord of my life. I make you Lord of my life. And I commit to following you. I commit to following you. From this day forward. From this day forward. Be the king of my heart. Be the king of my heart. And the Lord of my life. Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer.